Now, I have chosen a very controversial title for this talk, Why Classicism is a Dead Style. All my life I've been accused of working in the last century, well, in fact, in the last century, I was accused of working in the last century. Now, the last century is the century that accused me for so long of working in the last century. Um, um, I've been accused of this all through, of having some unholy connection with the dead. Well, the thing is, I'm kind of half dead myself. My, you know, my grandfather's dead, my grandmother's dead. So there's a lot of dead people in my family, and I'm pretty certain I'll become dead myself. Mind you, there is the legend to live on. So this, this title is, is, is hopefully to uh, effect some sort of counterintuitive revelation as to what it is about classicism that excites so much, to use that modern word, visceral anger among certain people that certain shapes that we find associated, simple shapes, cause often modernistic people to start rocking in their chair back and forward in panic, bouncing their legs and grinning in that special prophylactic style that you often see scientists and logical positives, various humanists and uh, secular humanists uh, <coughs> adopting. Well, let me say that the first thing uh, that that and is a, a source of anxiety is the fact that with a drawing like this, for instance, which is something I did a few years ago, it's just a little drawing of a fragment from the Parthenon marbles. It's the figure of the Ilissus, the river Ilissus, a river god. This is the river that Socrates crossed when he had that intimation from his inner daemon to actually um, dissuade him from taking a certain course. We draw drawings like this, artists like me, in a spirit of prayer. It's something like a seance, perhaps. We are anxious that old Papa Fidius, the sculptor, the father of us all, is, uh, his shade is somewhere in the fields of Asphodel, concerned that he's not being paid attention to anymore. And so in the spirit of the Tridentine Mass, for instance, the Christian version of this, we pay these homages daily for no purpose. The purpose is its own end. It's an end in itself, not a means to an end. In fact, we should go further and say we pay attention to these forms in a spirit of outright and self-confessing slavery. We are slaves to this style. All our lives as professionals, we've been accused of slavishly following a certain type of classical paradigm or canon. But I'd rather follow a master, or be a slave to a master that stretches for 2,500 years, than a slave to a regime that starts with, with Marcel Duchamp's toilet and Tracy Emin's bed at the end of it. It's not a handsome arc of endeavor. How do I get this thing going forward? Bottom slide, does that come up? Yeah. <clears throat> this building was built by John Simpson, a current classical architect. And it's at the back end of the Buckingham Palace scheme from the New Queen's Gallery. It's an extremely blank object. It, it eschews the window. You can't get in. There's hopes of windows up in that little attic story in there. The arch seems to go nowhere. The entrance is blocked off. This is the kind of thing that classicism is really good at. If you take a portrait bust, a classical portrait bust, you'll often find that the pupils aren't cut in. There is thus no way into that portrait bust. The bust will never clock you. And uh, it gives you its uh, email address or Facebook location. The bust seems to be saying, no entry here, stay out. This is like the tomb. Indeed, when this building was taken out from under its wraps, a certain very prominent royal, upon seeing it, said, the bloody thing looks like a mausoleum. He took this greatly uh, 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 in, in, bad, in bad faith, that somehow a piece of death, <coughs> something deadly had cropped up within the middle of this context. Of course, it's one of the very, very best parts of the building because it has a quality of monumental redundancy. Nothing can happen here. There is no utility possible. You can't even stand there and pose uh, handsomely. 
It seems to be an affront to existence itself. This is what makes it, to me, such a fascinating and properly pessimistic building. Moving now towards the standard of classical architecture, which says, keep out. We don't do welcome entrances in our buildings. We make monuments uh, of, of tectonic uh, substance. This is part of the problem that classicism has. It actually represents a, a, a denial of the will to live, <clears throat> as opposed to the various forms of contempor official contemporism, you know, the Zaha Hadid effect. These are all very life affirmative things. They're all air punching. The air is black and blue around them for all the punching that's done. Whereas in classicism, we have a denial of the will to live. And this fundamentally, strikes at the core of the tremendous uh, anger, serious anger that people can have against it. For instance, you go to Copenhagen, which is where you go to see the greatest sculpture in the world, and there you'll be introduced in the Lonely Planets text uh, to a paragraph about the great Torvaldsen Museum. Torvaldsen is a great sculptor. He died in 1844, the most famous artist alive. Walter Scott was dead. Richard Wagner had yet to start. And so it fell to a sculptor. And this was after Canova, who died in 1822, so that's another sculptor. There was a time at the beginning of the 19th century where the most famous artist alive, that is, no author, playwright, or composer, it was the sculptor at the highest point. And Torvaldsen takes neoclassicism into a beautiful Biedermeier territory, where it is both heimlich and monumental. By heimlich, I mean homely. Unheimlich means uncanny. Heimlich. It has a homely quality. You can see the beautiful corridors, all designed by the architect Bindisbo, Torvaldsen becoming a great hero of the resurgent Denmark at the time and required to come home from Rome, where he spent all his career to die on Danish soil because the, the unpleasantnesses with Germany are going to come up shortly. This is the Great Hall by Vin Bindus Bowl, designed in Torvaldsen's time to take his entire collection of plasters. The royal yacht, the, the frigate, the Rota, was sent over to Rome to take the entire studio contents home to Danish soil. And the building that was built for it is one of the most exquisite, I should say, the greatest museum in the world. That's only my opinion, but it's an informed opinion. It's also a mausoleum. At the center of it lies the tomb of the genius. And you can see how it's got this beautiful mastaba quality in the door cases. It's beautifully repetitious. There's nothing jarring. Everything's centralized. Everything's settled and sweet and kind. You can just tell by the demeanor of the people that are walking along in this picture that there's something about the sunny streets of Copenhagen, the happiest place in the world, that is being established at this kind of time. Our modern age comes along with a positive pathological detestation of that felicity and therefore decides it will have to build a pool in front of it. And the pool looks like this. It's a way, really, of scribbling out the guilty Biedermeier, Greco Biedermeier facade and disrupting and rendering jaggy, dissonant, dissonant the entire effect. There's a fantastic satisfaction about making this sort of incursion. Of course, they claim it's not a real intervention in the, the building. But you see, the satanic gesture has been done. A scribble out. This is a tattoo, worse still, a piercing, on the nose of Copenhagen. Inside, we have some of the most exquisite art, uh, sculptural forms that have ever been made. This was an amazingly revolutionary work at the time. Jason with the Golden Fleece. And it moves far from Torvalds, eh, from Canova, the prede predecessors, far from his style, because it has a very primitive chastity about it, a sort of Greek quality, completely eh, devoid of any of the rays of the failing sunset of the Baroque, as Canova's did. There is no sumptuousness here. It's got a scratched surface, and it's extremely graphic in its form. It's like a revival of the ar archaic forms that were at that point becoming uh, attractive. A work of great sophistication, commissioned, of course, by an Englishman, Thomas Hope. 
Uh, in the, of course, because the Torvalds Museum is here and now, it has to keep its nose clean. Therefore, it has to invite contemporists in on occasion to maintain its grant. And what the contemporists do is interventions like this. So these are done by artists, and this is happening all over the world. Some of my work in Edinburgh has had you know, attempts made in it to this effect, made in them. And what happens here is it was two artists who are thundering nonentities with no known skills come along and collaborate with Thorvaldsen, who is a titan with skills, as it were, straight in an uninterrupted conduit from heaven. And they say, oh, we're working with, with the great old masters, with the historic style. Poor Torvaldsen's lying in the tomb, going, aye, but I'm no happy with this. This is a fucking outrage. But I can't get out. I can't get out to complain. So talk about cultural appropriationism. It's really a poisonous thing, and it is the thin end of the ISIS wedge being promulgated by the very keepers of art in our time now. It's a cultural disaster and a shame for the West. You go to another building in, New, uh, in Copenhagen, the New Carlsberg Glyptotech. This is one of the tremendous apartments that were built on after the main Bozar building by the great 20th century Danish classicist Hack Kampmann. You know Denmark's police station. You know the one. It's like a... Well, Cray will describe it better than I will. It's an astounding building. And he built these, these suites of buildings on. And here they show tremendous collections of ancient and modern sculpture. It was the Carlsberg Brewery. Jakobsen, the man that, that ran it, was obsessed with sculpture, so he collected it all over. Now, you'll notice about a lot of these things that they're missing heads, missing arms. They've been toppled. This isn't just fair wear and tear, you understand. This is a consequence of actual action deliberated largely in the 4th and 5th centuries BC by Christian zealots who wore black and raged around the Syrian deserts, um, tearing down the demon em em images. And here you can see some of them, uh, a couple of them, since Cyril, I think, there. He's throwing down a statue of Athena. She's been represented as a positive demon. And somebody else is, is, is spoiling a picture. Uh, it's probably of Christ. It's, it's a possibility. It's interesting that these are iconophobes, but they're pictures of iconophobes. I rather like that uh, paradox. It was done systematically and deliberately. And we've always had this iconoclastic impulse driving along through all our cultures. It happens as soon as you are a child wishing to knock down the other child's sand castle. We have it centrally within us. But when, however, it is an image to be knocked down, then you are in a situation of surrogate murder, and that's terribly satisfying. We, in Scotland, for instance, we have the University of St. Andrews, and above it, here, stands the ruins of St. Andrews Cathedral. This was directed personally, this destruction, only a matter of hundred years, hundreds of years ago, just a few hundred years ago, by John Knox himself, you know, the great prophet of the Reformation in Scotland. John Knox wore a sort of tea cosy hat, just as the Taliban and ISIS do nowadays. And, of course, they're just maintaining... Sorry, uh, here we go. Well, I can't seem to get this to move on. Or... There's a wee thing come up here. Could you have a wee look? Sorry about this. Oh, so, uh, uh, yes, I can't go to St. Andrew's Cathedral. If I press that, it won't... It's just seized up. You see, yeah. well, we've done it. You see, this is, often my talks are interrupted because I'm saying things that offend the core of the cosmos. <laughs> uh, it, it's often happened. Strange explosions in rooms, all the lights die. So what we see here now from the internet is an explosion of an ancient building in Palmyra. A lady very distressingly shows what it used to be like before ISIS got to it now. What we're seeing is an exact 2,000, basically 2,000 year on uh, rehearsal of what happened uh, way back at the beginning of, this, of, of the, you know, two millennia ago of the Christian era, which gave us the ruinations that all the museums have. So you see, next time you go to the British Museum and you see a bust with the nose off it, always remember that this was done by a form of ISIS. 
The contemporary artists are doing this today. They're getting marble statues made and flaying them with chains and gaining major official grants for this sort of behavior. I should say that this kind of thing is all part of the mighty will to live that causes so much misery in the world. You see, David Cameron was quite wrong when he described the ISIS cult in the Houses of Parliament. He described the cult as a death cult. It's quite the opposite. The ISIS cult is a life cult. This is why it's so attractive to young men who, with their martyrdom secured, will go on into a paradise where life will be promulgated uh, 72 times. The virgin's species aren't quite specified. It may be in paradise 27 or 72 virgin stick insects, which is hardly comforting. But this is why young men go there. And they go there according to a kind of imperative that motivated your average Viking kid to get on that ship and sail across to Northumbria. It motivated so many of your young, thrusting leftists of the early 20th century who saw a fecht, a fight, going on in Spain and thought, I'm going there. Because a young man is a terrible biological imperative to bear arms. That's why we have knife crime in London today. To sort it, I would issue every young man with a knife a government-issue knife. That would fairly take the sails, wind out of its sails. He'd be punished if he were found not to be carrying it or carrying it blunt. So this is what we've, we're faced with, a tremendous zeal for violence. And then when we actually hit the cultural side of it, we see how the Taliban, who are the precursor of the, of the ISIS cult, how they got rid of the Buddhas of Bamayan. And they had to do this not, not because this represented an alien, non-Islamic culture. It wasn't that, because there's plenty of iconoclasts in the world who destroy images, not because, you know, not, not, not on account of any uh, belief system to represent, but simply because of the destruction of the thing in itself. And you can see the skateboarder here proceeding with glee in front of the absence of the, of the figure that used to stand in the alcove. It was, of course, the Buddha. It was, of course, a thing that stood still for centuries, was going to last longer than she was on her skateboard, was much bigger than her, and had a kind of empire, or at least of the spirit. Well, I'm going to talk now about some of the cultural backgrounds to this. There's one man, a philosopher, who you want to read if you want to understand what this affirmation of the will to live stroke denial of the will to live dichotomy is. It's Arthur Schopenhauer, the sage of Frankfurt, he who made the effective counterblast against the philosopher Hegel, his, Hegel's worship of the state, the world spirit, and all that. Schopenhauer was having none of it. Rather, he turned to the wisdom of the East, the first Western philosopher so to do seriously, read the Upanishads and the Buddha, Buddhist scriptures, and came to the conclusion that Christianity itself was derived from Buddhist uh, pre or, uh, precedence. Of course it would be. Buddhism is 600 years, and Alexandria is uh, old at the time of Christ. Alexandria is just down the road. It's the Manhattan of the ancient world. This is a very fine bust of the philosopher made by Elizabeth Ney, the grand nephew, great nephew, great, great niece, I mean, of the marshal of that name, Marshall Ney. She came to sit for Schopenhauer um, in his study the old philosopher, who was a fantastic misogynist, nevertheless was very impressed with this girl. And during the sittings, he noticed that she was looking, uh, she noticed that he was looking very hard at her mouth. And at one point, curiously, she said, Dr. Schopenhauer, can I ask why you're staring so intently at my mouth? And he said, well, you're such a good thing that I'm looking for evidence of a moustache. He couldn't believe she wasn't a dude. Now, Schopenhauer's misogyny has been a great help to the world because we are stopped from reading him by one tract that he wrote on women. Every Christmas, I give my students, at this, my assistants at the studio, a little literary present. Last year, it was On the Suffering of the World, a small selection of essays by Schopenhauer. And I said to them all, don't read the one on women first. 
read all the other stuff. So, of course, they all went and read on women, and they never read any more about it. How could you espouse the philosophy of man that had such thoughts, said one of them. And this is the great miracle that nature lays on for us. A philosopher arises in the world who is about to whistleblow and eyeball the world and all its mischief right to its core. And yet, he writes a horrible, perfunctory little essay, which is our excuse to dismiss him entirely. The world survives. The same thing can be said of an artist who was very influenced by Schopenhauer's teaching, the greatest artist that ever walked the face of the earth, in my opinion, Richard Wagner. Wagner's music is able to stop the world in its tracks. It is in great danger of doing that. The world's metabolic rate is constantly threatened to be reduced to a zero if this Wagner can prevail. But in order to prevent this, nature arranges that Wagner will write a horrible little tract called Judaism in Music, and that gets us off that hook so the world can proceed unmolested. Also, a very untypical Nazi of the 20th century has a great interest in his music. That's Adolf Hitler, very untypical Nazi. Most Nazis in music, they want oompa for music. They don't want sick puppy, six hour long operas about a wound that won't heal, legless chords and no evident tonic at a great and miniature scale. As Nietzsche said, Wagner was above all a great miniaturist. Your average Nazi doesn't want like that. He wants oompa, oompa, stick it up your jumper. And, and just as contemporary Nazis, they don't want Wagner either. What they want is hard rock, the equivalent. So Wagner, the world was saved from Wagner by virtue of the anti-Semitic tract. And the world was saved from Schopenhauer by virtue of the woman tract. But they both belong to a cultural tradition that you might say is antinatalist. It goes a way back to antiquity. Here's Raphael's account of the philosopher Aristotle, who first in the modern age postulated the idea that it would be better off not to have been born. This is called in antiquity the wisdom of Silenus. He's the drunken accompanier, companion of Dionysus, here seen uh, nestling with Dionysus. Dionysus, the god of wine, who gives us, by means of intake of an intoxicant, a certain kind of transitory death, a potential to free oneself from the horrors of existence. And Silenus, this wood, wood spirit, is the um, embodiment of this idea of an, a, a pursued nirvana, a snuffing out of the flame uh, by means of, of, of the blessing of, the wine, of, of wine, of viniculture. It's called The Wisdom of Silenus, and Friedrich Nietzsche, in his early book, The Birth of Tragedy, introduces this notion of the birth of Silenus when he's actually writing a pro-Wagnerian tract, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Wisdom of Silenus, better off not to have been. And the, great, the greatest pessimist religion of them all, Buddhism, has this fundamentally at its uh, core, so that if you are very good after so many uh, rotations or um, metempsychotic revolutions, metempsychosis, the transmigration of souls. I'm just talking dirty for you just now. Uh, after so many, you'll be rewarded, not with a, birth in, uh, a rebirth in paradise with 72 virgins to cope with. No, no, you're actually given nirvana, which is a Sanskrit word meaning the stuffing out of the flame. That's your reward. No more life ever again. And these are, of course, amongst the most civilized thoughts in the world. No more life and no more life uh, produced. No more suffering humans. Practically, the great Kumela, the gathering of Hindu sages on the banks of the Ganges, gives a tremendous, as it were, celebration of this idea of giving up everything. They are in ecstasy, these naked philosophers, these gymnosophists. That was what Eric Satie was meaning when he wrote these poems, these little tunes. The naked philosophers, gymnos and sophist. And it was after these chaps here that we see today still going that Alexander the Great first crossed the Hindu Kush to get there because he'd heard that there were naked philosophers in India, just like Diogenes, the Greek philosopher in Corinth. These people 
give up absolutely everything. They have their penises broken by their gurus, uh, and they live completely adobed up with nothing but ganja to keep out the cold. They do it for us. We just don't have the nerves of steel required. For instance, mortification of the soul of the body. It's absolutely fundamental to the idea they will stand in one leg for 50 years or on top of a column. This man has for 43 years held this arm upright. This is to do with a long, long-standing kind of crucifixion. It's a chronic crucifixion as opposed to one catastrophic event. This is the bearer of the other catastrophic event represented in a style which is itself extremely antagonizing to certain people. But children love it. They just look at that and think, he looks so kind. Activists, however, say he looks so white. Nobody cares about that. Look, here he is looking black again. You see, this is an authentic image of an Indian Jesus. When the missionaries went across to India in the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries, <coughs> they hoped to convert the entire teeming strand of India to Christianity. And the Indians said, that's fine. We'll have Jesus as one of our gods too. And they said, it's not quite the idea. But this is how he is worshipped still. And they, of course, Christianity in India is extremely ancient. So these are images of the good and the pure and the true, the self-sacrificing, the life-denying, the ones that blow the whistle on life. Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world. This is why it's so very hard to get young men, or anybody these days, because we're all young men in the infantilization of culture. We're all young men and we can't go to church. It's just too much. I mean, asking us to close our eyes during prayers, come on, be realistic. The greatest challenge. What are the great objections then to classicism? You see, for instance, there's always the slave angle. Slavery is very good for the enemies of classicism. But they never, they never invoked Dubai, for instance, which is also built in slave labor, mostly uh, Bangladeshis, I believe. So they invoke this look of uh, old Louisiana <clears throat> and say, well, if you're building like this, you're, you know, you're um, advocating slavery. Uh, but then again, what does abolitionist architecture look like? You know, am I not a man and a brother was an abolitionist plaque designed by John Flaxman, kind of neoclassicist. And then when you look at the biggest monument where you'll see black families standing to this day, being photographed in the interior of it, really meaning it, where Martin Luther gave his great speech from, this could be said to be associated, at least, abolitionist architecture. And then, so that doesn't work. The slave angle doesn't work. Now, then we look at a building like this. Now, this is a, one of these horrible, what do you call that, Craig, an exonometric. Isn't it awful? Oh, it just makes me want to throw up. Why bother? It just gives a perspective. So this is a sort of blown up building, you know, perfectly respectable modernist building. It's got a kind of open bit here, and it's all sheets of glass right through the back. It's a political building. It was made to say that the political uh, body that operates in here operates in incorruptible transparency. So you can see through the building. You know that old thing, the democratic roof that we've got in Berlin, such a lot of poppycock. It was actually the headquarters of the fascist party of, of, of Como. Uh, and you can see it's all trigged up for the arrival of somebody from Germany. So the idea of the Nazi argument cannot really be, a, be, be um, being brought forth in the argument against classicism. Hitler did not build in the style of Nazism. He should have, if he was wanting to build Nazi buildings, he should have built the Shard. It's ugly, brutal, sharp, sore looking, invasive, and it's the kind of thing you go to A and E to get taken out of your eye. A Shard. So we can't really say that it's the Nazi thing, although, well, that was one really great thing that was great for modernism, because uh, Nazism kind of, well, Nazism kind of liked classicism. Except the most famous of all the Bauhaus buildings ever made was by a star pupil of the Bauhaus called Fritz Ertel. And it's called Auschwitz. One toilet for 300,000 female prisoners. That's form and function in a hellish alliance. So do we object to classicism because of its association with the aristocracy? Well, here's the Duchess of Devonshire in front of her big pad, you know, and we could really resent that. But, you know, the thing is, there are all sorts of aristocracies, aristocracies now and kleptocracies. You look at half of London, and we don't know what Jobble McJobface here 
uh, what kind of pad he likes to live in, but we don't really think it will look anything like Chatsworth or, or Blenheim. Look at him there. He's become such... I mean, this man, if the British Empire were thought to be huge, this man has an empire, or had an empire about the size of the Atia quadrant of Universe 6. We were really playing at it in the British Empire. Look at that look that he's got. It's absolutely terrifying. I know everything. And then he's got his pole neck on. Notice that. You know? He's such an architect. <laughs> One thing that really does make the modernist spirit quake when a classical building arises is the way it so beautifully husbands shadow. Now, modernists have this great love of light. You know, you go to a new modernist building and they say the architect specializes in the handling of light. They always say it in a sort of hysterical way. They don't say light. They say light. You see, it's a thing. It's the sun. It's the high noontide. Uh, Nietzsche's high noontide. Whereas in the classical world, we are more interested in shades, shadows, dark and dim religious, or dim religious lights, as Milton put it. And so there's a great science of the way that shadows fall, as Scruton has put it. Shadows in architecture are where the gods live. I should say gods plus fairies. It's also to do, the objections to do with the idea of the purity and whiteness of it. So when they see this, often a modernist will shout out, but didn't the Greeks always colour their sculptures and architecture? They say it very angrily, because what they're seeing here is a pallor of death, and they want to put some colour into the cheeks of the building. So, but when you show them this, well, they kind of like it, but it looks too distinguished. It's not high-vis enough. It doesn't have that ghastly building site yellow, you know, that greeny yellow color. See, what they really want is something more like this. You see, this is uh, Mr. Baboon. He paints his face in these extraordinary colors to match the rear elevation of Mrs. Baboon when her time is right, so that you'll never be short in the tribe of being reminded of, of what the fundamental function of the tribe is. It's there all the time, <coughs> literally in your face. So this is the savagery of color, and color is often invoked to ac account for our uh, baser emotions. I was green with envy, he had a yellow stripe down his back, it's a red rag to a bull. Nobody ever said it's a triangular rag to a bull. So color is, is the way of uh, exciting our terribly frightening emotions. It is, in fact, a primal expression of the will, the will to live. Now, of all these things that maybe modernism, the culture, the barbarian cultures of all territories, all times, of which modernism is one, eh, avowedly, modernism likes to regard itself as a, a, sec, a, a, as a secular and iconoclastic idiom. Eh, but of all the things that I've come to the crunch, and I've come to the end of my talk now, of, it comes to the crunch, the fundamental objection, I think, and this has cosmic significance, is the fact that classicism embraces symmetry. So when you meet the Dalai Lama, he does this to you. You see, when you meet Hitler, he does this to you. Oh, Bert, did you film me doing that? Look, what I mean is, you see, Hitler salute doesn't work like this. It just looks as though you're on the diving board. Worker's power, good. Worker's power, just, it's hopeless. So, these aggressive, refractory, and belligerent cultures all really adopt an asymmetry of one sort or another. And modernism is absolutely terrified of symmetry. It has to disrupt it. So, for instance, if we look at a building like this, this is by Alexander Greek Thompson, the greatest romantic classical architect in the world. This is the great temple that he built with a Hindu stupa at the top, various Egyptianizing bits, and then a Greek center. And it's all made, it's a highly picturesque, asymmetrical composition. But you see how every part of this asymmetrical composition, composition resolves down into a local symmetry. It always comes back to this. The in general scheme, unlike so much of this, is asymmetrical, but the individual parts come back to that home territory, that tonic chord at the end of the piece of music, the symmetry. One side cancels out the other. It's a sort of architectural, formal snuffing out of the flame. 
It's a nirvana in architectural terms. I think this is at the root, the absolute root of the detestation of classicism that stretches from so far back to our time now. It has a fatal um, association with the self-denial, the self-cancelling, the suicide of symmetry. Now, to finish, I'm going to take you in a very strange excursion. You were here when it happened. This is an image of a man from about 260 AD, one of the early Christians in Rome. He was coming from Sinope, which is where Diogenes the Cynic came from 400, uh, 600 years before. This is a fanciful image of him. This man's name is Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. Marcionism was a cult, an early Christian cult that followed much Pauline teaching in the early Christian church. And Marcion was very wealthy, and he was up for the papacy. I mean, the church at that time wasn't big, and it was kind of underground, but he would be, have been the leader of it. Marcion had this strange idea about Jesus and God and everything in the creation of the world. His idea was that primarily there was a good God and a bad God. There's a lot of Manichaeanism in this, right? A good God and a bad God. And the good God and the bad God were engaged in a kind of mutual double Nelson. It was like these wrestlers that held each other together in a constant grip so that nothing could happen. And then the good God somehow managed to inadvertently let go of the bad God. And when he did so, bang, creation occurred. Creation is the function of the bad God in Marcionism. And what happens then is that time and space are made and the, every condition is laid down for the principium, principium individuat ionis, the individuating principle, to occur. Pluralities will now be possible. A there and a here will be possible. A then will be possible and a now will be possible. Without time and space, there is no there or here, no then and now. It's all one thing. So that from this absolute mighty explosion, which we've come to call the Big Bang, the action of the bad God, the bad God, that creation is the consequence of an evil demon. So from all this, we get the suffering of the world secured. Everything that's ghastly, horrible, mean, vile, atrocious, everything that you regret was ever born, an egg that was fertilized, every sort of ghastly, horrible arrangement was, oh, just to be fair, it was, 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 <laughs> was secured on earth so that fighting and copulation should proceed on and the real monstrous businesses of existence should come into play and in time great monuments will be made to this creation. Monuments like this for instance, you see how it sodomizes the London skyline and not only this, it has within it a very diagram of the principle of the building blocks of life itself, the double helix of the DNA code. It seems to me like a hellish devil laughter <laughs> that comes up out of London. Now, proper little buildings that we like, proper buildings that we like, they're here to counteract that thing. They open embassies of not being in the world of being. They open embassies of the still world within the world of tumult. They open up territories of pity and kindness in, in the world of unscrupulous, heartless callousness. Now, this is a scientific diagram of the condition, uh, the situation. I can't possibly explain it to you, but I have it in good faith from colleagues at the University of the West of Scotland, where I have my studios in Paisley. And this really shows us the action of the Big Bang, but as far as they can do it. It's called some sort of proliferation theory. And this is all the stuff starting up, you know, Tony Blair's about there. And in here, well, we've got the first thing. And they've come, these people, these scientists, to explain it to us lay people, they've come to call that first thing a spontaneous asymmetry. 
You see? So you might say that modernism, with its love of asymmetry, and young women, uh, girls at school, I've got three daughters, I can remember when they go out to school, they have to have a shirt tail hanging out of their shirt, and they have to make sure they spoil their school photograph by putting on a squint smile. How the idea of an asymmetry is actually embodied at the very core of the black hole that sits in the middle of our galaxy. So you might say that modernism is, is one long hymn of praise to creation. Classicism, on the other hand, is an outright defiance thereof. Modernism, the proof of it is, it has such a detestation of symmetry that the great challenge to all modernists is how to arrange for the fireplace. How unhomely is that? As you might say, cold as a stepmother's kiss. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.